So today we're going to uh, cover the major elements of an NIH SBIR STTR proposal. Primarily we're focusing on uh, phase one proposal here. Phase two proposals do have different requirements. Um, if through, I'm, as I'm going through things, if you have a question, if you're working on a phase two and you have a question about something, feel free to put that in chat and Shelly, you're monitoring the chat, correct? Yeah. So um, we can cover that during questions if, if anything comes up. Okay, first we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna sort of give you the lay of the land, give you a couple of things to keep in mind as you start your proposal. Um, then we're gonna cover the two major sections first, which are specific aims and the research strategy section. I'll touch on the other supporting documents that may be required. Some are required no matter what, others might be or might not be. I'm gonna briefly touch on budgets. There's a whole nother workshop um, in the FAST Center's library focused on budgets, or if it's not available, um, we offer that periodically. So you can, you can check out that workshop specifically on budgets. That's a whole hour in itself. So I'll briefly touch on budgets. And then we'll go over review criteria. Um, and while we are not gonna cover this today, I wanna remind everybody that the first step in preparing your application is always completing your registrations. Um, and if you're submitting to NIH, that means you must re, uh, have a DUNS number, an EIN number, you must be registered and have an active registration on SAM. You must be registered on grants.gov and you must be registered on ERA Commons. So those, all five of those are required to successfully submit an NIH proposal. All right, so before you begin writing, um, a lot of you may have experienced writing other research grants, other uh, funding mechanisms for NIH, and you'll actually be really surprised at how similar SBIR is. You will very quickly recognize the review criteria as well as the format of the proposal. Uh, there are a couple of nuances that are different for SBIR and STTR proposals. The first is it's always really, really important to remember that the focus is on the company. It's the company that's getting the award. It's the company that's developing the technology that you're going to commercialize. So even if you're partnering with a research institution, everything needs to be focused on the company. And one way that I found is really a great way to remind reviewers on an ongoing basis that you're a company and not a researcher uh, is to write the proposal in third person. That's best practice in grantmanship in general is to use third person, but especially important in SBIR. Um, so you can refer to the company by name or specific team members by name, and it helps the reviewer sort of um, develop an understanding of everybody's roles, but again, reminds them it's a company submitting. Um, you're going to provide details of team members' roles. Uh, a lot of times in, in traditional research projects, it's not so much important on who's doing what, um, but in NIH SBIR, you're using a detailed budget. And so we want to, throughout the work plan, attach um, sort of tasks and responsibilities to team members as you're talking about what you're going to do. So then when a reviewer goes to the budget, they say, oh yeah, I know John probably is getting a fair amount of salary. I saw his name in almost every task that was presented. He's, he's really doing a lot on this project. And finally, it's important to keep in mind that the end goal of this project is to commercialize technology. So everything you do and propose should be incrementally moving that technology further along the continuum to commercialization. Nobody expects this to be a totally beautiful finished product at the end of phase one, but you should be closer to commercialization at the end of phase one than you were when you started. So the first thing that you need to do if you haven't already done so um, is select an opportunity that you're going to apply to. Now for NIH, you typically have two general, question, two general opportunities. The first is the omnibus, which is a really large opportunity that covers 24 institutes and centers. Um, you do not have to select a particular institute or center or identify anything special if you're going in under the omnibus, it's sort of the catch-all. The other opportunity may be a special solicitation. Special solicitations are issued by individual institutes and centers or are prepared collaboratively by institutes and centers. Um, they are still the SBIR, STTR mechanism, so make sure that they still have that, that SBIR code on them, which is the R41, 42, 43, or 44. 
Um, but they have sometimes they have separate review um, study sections. Sometimes they have different um, budget allocation than a traditional omnibus solicitation. So those are your two options. You can go um, omnibus or special solicitation. Again, you do, you're not required to identify an institute or center prior to submission. Um, if you don't uh, identify one, it will be your application will be assigned to the most appropriate one by NIH. 99.9% .9 of the time they get that right and they do a great job of, of assignment. Um, so usually you don't need to worry about that. And it is recommended that you contact a program officer at NIH prior to submission. And if you're going to do that, um, you would need to find an institute or center that might be interested in your technology. It's not required to contact the program officer. It's just sort of best practices. I'd say maybe 70% of the time they're going to get back to you and give you some decent feedback. Um, the other 30% of the time, they might be really difficult to pin down. By the way, you can find all the contact information in the omnibus solicitation. It tells you program officers for every um, opportunity. So even before we're still even before you begin writing, um, you want to draft your specific aims really, really early. And the reason is, is because every single thing in the proposal should come back to those aims. So your team um, should be built around what work you're proposing in your aims. Your budget should be built around your specific aims. The facilities that you need should tie to your specific aims. If you say you're going to do these super high tech experiments, you know, you need to be describing that type of facility in your facilities document. So everything comes back to the aims. So that's the first thing you should do is really draft those aims. And to do that, you want to think about what are your key technical challenges? What do you need to overcome technically to demonstrate feasibility? And again, move that technology along the, to the continuum to commercialization. If the company does not have the skills or equipment to address those technical challenges, then you need to be thinking about potential partners um, and what roles they could play to help you address those, those technical challenges, whether that's a consultant or doing a sub award with a, a research partner like a university or bringing in a fee for service contractor. And then look at your own internal team. Um, you need to have the right people on the bus in the right seats. I just got off a call with somebody who um, is developing a technology uh, for use in the um, animal production industry. And while they're amazing researchers in animal production, none of them have ever commercialized any technology in that industry. So they need to get somebody on their team who has experience commercializing technology in that field. That person would just serve as a consultant or an advisor, but that's a key role that they need to have filled. So sort of use your specific aims to identify what key roles you need to fill. And then get that early support from those uh, key opinion leaders and potential strategic partners if you can. If you have your eye on getting um, aligned with a particular partner, start those conversations very early. All right, now you're going to get to work on the first two major sections. The first is the specific aims section. Specific aims is limited to one page, um, and typically your aims should be presented in chronological order. I like to start all of my aims with action items or with action words. Um, so I don't like extra words in general. So when people write to, to design and develop, I take off the word to and just start with design and develop. So they should be very specific. And I like to follow this little formula. Um, you don't have to stick to it exactly, but I find that it works really well to tell the story. And in the first paragraph, you're going to describe the, the problem. Why should anyone care? And we know that NIH has a, a heavy focus on patient outcomes and reducing healthcare costs. So your focus on the problem um, should, should include a discussion of how this problem is affecting um, people either lives, um, prolonged illness, increased healthcare costs, really what's the problem, you know, really clearly define the problem for them. I would expect to see a lot of citations in that paragraph. Um, this is where you're really kind of doing a literature search to, um, to, to let reviewers know that the problem is real and needs to be addressed. Paragraph two, focus on what's the current state of the art. 
sure this is a problem and now here's how um, people are typically solving this problem now and here's why it doesn't work so um, you know sure um, there's a current solution on the market for dvt prevention but um, there's low compliance and um, from patients and and nurses so the problem is you know it, it, it's uncomfortable it's loud um, you know, if you're talking pharmacological solutions, you know, nobody wants to take aspirin every day or whatever it is, you just sort of tell them what they're doing now and why it's not working. And then in the third paragraph, you introduce your solution. Specifically, you introduce your company as well. So NUCO is working on an innovative solution to better address the problem of DVT prevention in post-op patients. Um, and so you sort of say what you're doing, why you're doing it better, and what the results will be, what your outcomes are. And then paragraph four is when you get to the project. So you can tell paragraph three is really big picture, right? We're talking about like kind of what you're going to have at the end. What's the end goal here? But then paragraph four, we really hone it into the project. So what's the overall goal of that project? Maybe the overall goal is to develop and commercialize um, a, a new um, diagnostic tool or the goal of the project is to um, launch a, a innovative uh, SaaS platform for enrolling patients in clinical trials or whatever it is. So it's sort of the, the overall goal. But to get there, what specifically are you gonna do in phase one? So then you might follow it up with in phase one, you're gonna demonstrate the feasibility of uh, the new diagnostic on a, using a, a limited sample from your lab you know, or whatever. So phase, so you go really big and then you just kind of inch it down until you're focused on phase one and then even smaller is your specific, each specific aim. What are you going to do each step to achieve what you said you were going to have be your overall phase one goal? And then I end, I like to end this page with a summary paragraph um, that says at the end of phase one, we will have or know or have demonstrated sort of what's the expected outcome at the end of phase one. What comes next? In phase two, we'll focus on a large scale clinical trial at multiple sites, whatever you're gonna do in phase two. And it's just a guess. It doesn't mean they're gonna hold you to it, but this is, you know, you're sort of saying, assuming all this works in phase one, here's what we think we'll do in phase two. And then always include a sentence or two about the commercial opportunity. Um, so, you know, just really doesn't have to be detailed, but a significant market opportunity exists with over 1.1 billion patients, you know, um, having medical procedures a year or whatever it is, you know, just sort of a, a real short, short snapshot of the commercial market. So that's specific aims. And again, this is the most important document as it's going to inform every other document in the proposal. All right, then the next document is the research strategy. And this is the real heart of the proposal. This is where most of the meat is. Um, this is limited to six pages. And it's sort of like an expansion of the specific aims page. And again, that's why that aims page is so, so important. This is the narrative description of your project or the story of how you're going to realize uh, what you have planned for phase one. Again, write it in third person. Um, and if you've written NIH research grants before, you will recognize those three subsections. The first is the significance. The second is innovation, followed by approach. And we're gonna go through each of those. So a, a significant section is just kind of like a expansion of the discussion we had in that first paragraph of phase one. Why is this problem important to solve? What are the current shortcomings in the market? How does this translate to other fields or problems in other industries? Um, you know, that's, that's usually a really uh, important thing to show reviewers if you can, sort of the dual use of the technology or, you know, hey, if we can solve this problem in this market, you know, we see future expansion in this market that will help even more patients. Uh, so really kind of going beyond just the scope of, of what you're presenting here. Uh, generally, I like to say this section should be at least a half a page, but no more than one page. Remember, we only have six pages here. 
Um, and significance is an important section, but it's not the most important section. So it shouldn't take up more than a page. I would also expect to see a significant amount of citations here of peer reviewed literature to support your case. Innovation is a very important section. Um, and even though it's very important, it typically does not require a lot of real estate. So I would also expect this to be no more than a page, um, but it should be at least half a page. Uh, this is a big section for the scoring criteria, especially in SBIR, STTR. And the thing about innovation is that um, typically people, when they write this section, they leave lots of room for interpretation for the reviewers. And that's actually the exact opposite of what we want to do. So I start this, this section with a very strong statement of innovation. And it literally, I literally say the innovation of this technology is and then state whatever you feel like that sort of golden nugget or whatever your IP is based on. State it for the reviewers. We are telling the reviewers what the innovation is. We do not want them to read our proposal and interpret on their own what the, the innovation is. Because if they do, you probably won't like what they come up with and they, they will miss that, that, um, that real key, you know, kind of sexy SBIR risky high tech portion of it. So we really need to clearly state that for them right off the bat. Once you do that, um, you need to sort of uh, invest some trust in this section here and sometimes share a little bit more than you might be comfortable with. I'm certainly not saying make a disclosure that um, goes against whatever your, your IP attorney is telling you or anything, but it's important for reviewers to really understand how things work um, and what makes them innovative. And they can typically only do that by you sharing information. So you really wanna tell them what the innovation is. I would also include a short paragraph here about your, your IP position. Um, so they're aware there are some agencies um, who care about IP more than others. Uh, I recently heard an NSF reviewer say that if you don't have a patentable idea, it's gonna be very hard to get funding from NSF right now. I think that's less the case at NIH, um, but still they really want to know what your IP position is. All right, and then the approach section. Now this is the section that needs to be the longest. So generally speaking, this should be four pages or, or more. Um, and it's critically important. This is the number one area where reviewers score poorly um, because, they, because people don't provide enough detail. So you really, really need to think about lots and lots of detail here. Uh, this should be incredibly detailed. And typically I organize this section with the following subheaders. First, I talk about preliminary studies, and then I talk about your phase one work plan, and then I do a summary section. So the preliminary studies, oh, I think I have a slide for that, let's see. Yeah, preliminary studies are gonna walk the reviewer through everything you've done to this point. So sort of, you know, what, what was the initial discovery? Have you done prototypes? Have you participated in pitch competitions? Have you done, um, you know, limited feasibility studying, bench, bench top testing? What have you done so far? Just kind of give them the whole background. And it takes them all the way up until right the start of phase one. And the reason this is really important, this is critically important in NIH, whoops. They, they will say that preliminary data is not required, and I'm going to tell you that I think it is. And Shelly, you would probably agree with that. I see you shaking your head. Yeah. Preliminary data is absolutely required. Now, how you interpret what preliminary data is, there, there's room for interpretation there. Um, it could be, you know, you, maybe you, um, you threw together a, a focus group of 15 parents who have kids with autism and you know, really talked about you know, the need for a, an app to help you know, um, older kids with autism feel safe in the community or whatever it is. Um, you know, and you could say like, look, we had a focus group with 15 parents and here are their real needs and you know, here's how we discovered those things. But you have to have some sort of preliminary evidence to suggest that your proposal has the likelihood to be successful. Not the case in NSF, which we're not talking about today, NSF loves risk. NIH is more risk adverse. So you need to make the reviewer feel comfortable that you've done at least some preliminary work. 
Okay, then the next section of the approach, this next subsession is the actual phase one work plan. I typically do an introductory paragraph that sort of sets the stage for the reviewer. I tell them who the principal investigator is and what their background is. Um, I tell them about other members of the team and, and introduce a research partner if there's a research partner doing um, some of the work. I re revisit the overall goal. Uh, I give a timeline for the project and, you know, kind of set the stage and say, you know, we hope to accomplish this. The team hopes to accomplish this work in 12 months or six months or eight months or whatever it is. Um, so I just sort of set the stage. It's just sort of like a little executive summary before the big work plan. One of the challenges is that you can't control how a reviewer reviews your proposal. And so um, some people like to go straight to that work plan piece. They like to go straight to the approach. Uh, other people might start with a specific games page, but what that paragraph in front of the, the approach does is if a reviewer is skipping all the other documents and going straight there, it sort of covers what we've already covered. Um, and, and it also gives a quick introduction again to the team, which I think is critically important. Um, so anyway, that, I mean, you don't have to do that, but that's, I like to sort of set the stage for them. And the next thing, the next section, you're gonna go into your specific aims. Now, once you state your specific aims, you should always state them exactly the same. So that means when you write them in your specific aims section, I literally copy and paste. I copy and paste into this section. I copy and paste into the abstract. Anytime you're using your aims, they need to appear exactly as they did in the specific aims section. Changing the even the slightest word can throw a reviewer off. So you wanna make sure those are always consistent. I use aims as subheaders um, underneath that approach, phase one work plan section. Then I use each aim as another set subheader. And under each aim, you are going to provide explicit detail on the tasks that are required to achieve each aim, step-by-step step, in chronological order. And I'll show you an example of what that might look like. Um, but each task should include details of who, what, when, where, why, how, with what resources, with what people, with what equipment. Um, it should be extremely detailed. It, it, it should be sort of like a lab notebook. Somebody should be able to come in and, and reproduce what you're doing um, using what you're describing here. And I know sometimes that's really hard for people because they say, well, I don't even know what I'm going to do. How do I know what I'm going to do until I get in there and do it? That is part of the, the um, excruciating practice that is writing an SBIR proposal. So it, it, it can be very frustrating, um, but the majority of the time after people do that, they say, wow, I'm really glad I wrote all that out because I realized X, Y, and Z. So it is a really useful exercise. Um, and even if it's not useful, it doesn't matter, it's required. So you, you will not get funded without a very detailed work plan, very detailed approach section. Then at the end of each aim, so each aim is their, its own little section. I do another little paragraph that is, has a subheader title of aim one or aim two, aim three. Aim one, milestones, potential pitfalls, and alternative strategies. And I provide exactly what that says. Um, I give the reviewer the measurable evidence that we are gonna use to determine whether or not we have met the specific aim. So if in aim one, we, we say we're going to um, build a prototype um, you know, that can process 50 samples in three minutes, then the measurable aim is going to be, you know, at the end of this aim, we will have successfully demonstrated the prototype can um, uh, process 50 samples in three minutes. Um, what could go wrong is potential pit pitfalls. Potential pitfalls include the design selected will not be able to meet the time, the desired time parameters and the alternative strategies. May be that you um, consult an outside design expert to identify areas, you know, to improve efficiency, or you're just, you're just trying to show reviewers here that your milestone relates directly to your aim and that you've thought about things that could go wrong and you have a backup plan. 
So I think that's important to do for each aim. Sometimes people do it as a big section at the end of the aims, but I think it gets lost for the reviewers on which task you're talking about. So I found that it's better to do it all, all at once. So this is a very simplified version of a work plan, but you can see here's specific aim one. Okay, and this company, for the sake of example, is making a new tomato sauce. Their specific aim one is measure the acidity level of new coast tomato sauce compared to five leading brands. And I walk you through step by step what they're going to do. Again, a very simplified version to illustrate the level of detail that's required uh, when you're, you're breaking out your aims. And I would expect, again, this is a story. <clears throat> this is an, <clears throat> excuse me, a narrative description. <clears throat> So it should flow like a story. It should be really easy to read. That's the main thing we wanna do is make a proposal enjoyable for a reviewer to read. And then the summary section. And I use a subheader that says summary. Um, I typically introduce uh, one or two sentences um, that provide sort of an overview of the project. <clears throat> Reiterate like we did on that bottom page of the specific aims. Uh, where we had the bottom paragraph of specific aims. We talked about what we would have or know at the end of phase one, what you plan for phase two. So we do the same thing here. We talk about <clears throat> what you will have or know. Here's how we know phase one is done. Here's what we're thinking we're gonna do in phase two. Um, and then uh, I include this very simple, this is not a Gantt chart, you'll notice. This is a very simple word table. Um, Gantt charts are incredibly difficult to read when you drop them in a proposal. And so the simpler, the better. Absolutely, the simpler, the better. I just copy and paste the aims, mention team members, team members by name as to who's responsible, copy the milestones from the, the narrative version above, and then just show reviewers visually when those things will take place over the, the project period. This is essentially a visual representation of the entire proposal that you just wrote. Again, we can't control what reviewers do. Some reviewers are visual people and we'll go here first. So we wanna make sure whatever we present here is accurately represented in the narrative above. And this, similarly, we want this to represent, we want the narrative above to represent, to, to reflect what's in the table. So again, very simple Gantt chart. And then I do a final paragraph, usually underneath this Gantt chart with a subheader of commercialization. Now, NIH does not require commercialization information in their phase one proposals. Um, you will typically see in an NSF about the first four pages of a phase one are focused on commercialization. Not the case for NIH. You won't find mention of commercialization in the guidelines at all, but it's becoming increasingly important. And so the level of detail that you need here is, is not super great. Um, I'm talking about basic stuff, like here's who our customer is, here's what the market size is, here's the typical sales cycle or pattern for this. Uh, you know, an example might be if you have something that you're going to sell to hospitals, um, you might let reviewers know that you understand that, um, you know, it's, it's the procurement department in the hospital that buys the products, not um, you know, a patient can't re request, for example, what brand of pacemaker they want. So, you know, just sharing with reviewers that you understand the market. So we're not talking about a lot of commercial information here, we're talking about a very short paragraph, which just shows them that you're thinking about these things. Again, this is a program designed to commercialize technology. So everything you do should be moving it closer to commercialization. All right, Shelly, any questions on those major sections? I don't have any so far. If anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. All right, we'll go on to other supporting documents. So here's a list of the other supporting documents and we'll talk about each one of these or each kind of section of these individually. But you can see when you get done with those two documents, you are not done uh, at all. And each one of these documents have very specific requirements that are spelled out in the guidelines. <clears throat> so always refer to the guidelines for what should go in those sections. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, they're all separate documents that get uploaded to the forms packet. 
whether you're using grants.gov or um, what I like to use. Shelly, do you like assist better than grants.gov? Yeah, I like assist better. Yeah, me too. So ERA, NIH's own platform, ERA Commons, has an application uh, platform called Assist. I think it's much easier to use. It, it does a better job not allowing you to submit with errors. Um, so if you are using Assist or Grants.gov, either one, each one of these documents has a separate place where it's uploaded in the forms packet. Um, I like to start off each document page with the header that describes what the document is. So in case a reviewer gets lost, they know what they're looking at. They also become very familiar with the order of documents as they're presented in their packets for review. And so just by providing that header there, you're sort of giving them a sense of predictability that they're comfortable with. Uh, be consistent uh, with all of these documents and use the same formatting that you've used in other documents. So if you've used Arial, 11 point font, half inch margins, make sure all of these documents are also Arial, 11 point font, half inch margins. I refer to the guidelines for the full details on which goes in every document. Um, it's not enough to um, put what you think goes in there. You really need to look at the guidelines and the, the, the instructions are very clear. So once you read them, it's not a mystery what needs to be in there. But what that also means is it's going to be super obvious if you submit a facilities document, if you haven't read the guidelines, it'll be pretty clear. Uh, also important to not use these extra documents to circumvent the page limit. Um, this can be a problem if you're, for example, submitting human subject sections or vertebrate animal sections. Uh, make sure that you still include some information in the proposal about those things. You can't just for everything see, you know, for your aim. If your aim is conduct animal studies, you can't say see vertebrate animal section. You still have to include details in there. Um, but the these attachments are in addition to. And it's important to note that there are no other attachments or appendices permitted at all. And the first is the project abstract. I always write this last. Um, it's limited to 30 lines of text, uh, no proprietary information. And in my mind, I, or not in my mind, in my practice, I just simply make it a simple specific aims page. I take this specific aims page and I just shrink it down to 30 lines of text. Um, you include sort of all the high points, you include the problem, you include the current solutions on the market, you include an introduction to the company, and you include your specific aims. You know, it's, it's literally a, a mini version of the aims with no proprietary information. The project narrative is actually um, not what it sounds. Um, it's only it's limited to two or three sentences. So it's a very, in layman's terms, very simple description of your project as it relates to public health. Um, it's typically used to communicate your award with your elected officials, with your congressional officials. Uh, very simple, three sentences, two to three sentences. Every person on your project that's considered key, a key person, will be required to complete an NIH compliant biosketch. So this includes people working directly on the project on your team, your collaborators, consultants, uh, if you're working with a research institution at a university. Key persons is a designation that uh, you, you will use if you appear in a certain place on the budget. Um, so if you're a principal investigator or contributing to the science uh, of the project. If you have a meaningful role in the project, you're considered key persons and you will be required to prepare a biosketch. You must use NIH's format. So do not submit a traditional CV or a traditional resume. It must be an NIH's biosketch format, which is available online and also in the guidelines um, that you need to read. There are um, some required sections of the biosketch. The biosketch recently uh, underwent uh, revision and they released new guidelines in May. So some of this will stay the same and some of it is getting ready to change. The first section, section A is the personal statement. And this is a really important section. This is where you sort of provide a narrative of your experience. And this is super important for 
people on your teams who may be more industry and less academia. And the reason it's important is because this bio sketch is designed for people in academia. We know you're not in academia if you're from the industry side, that's okay. Uh, but we use the form that we've been given. And so the personal statement is your opportunity to really tell your story. This is also a great place to tell stories like, uh, you know, I have lots of clients who have started companies um, based on personal experience. So, you know, I cared for my mother and father for 15 years as they battled Alzheimer's. And I noticed that there was no way for, you know, them to enjoy uh, their favorite old songs, you know, or whatever it is. And so sort of that connection um, to why you started the company and why you're, you're so passionate about it. The next section is position and honors, and it will be revised to be called positions, appointments, and honors. And this is your sort of traditional resume section where you're going to put um, your history, you know, your employment history. Um, and then the next section is contributions to science. Uh, now, this is tricky for industry folks because you might not have any contributions to science, and that's okay. Again, that's okay. Um, but if you're more of a researcher and you have publications, you must divide your contributions into in science contributions to science into five distinct discussions. And under each one of those discussions, you are allowed to uh, share four corresponding citations. So it used to be you would just list all of your public your published articles on your NIH biosketch. Well, now they have to be connected to a, a discussion of a contribution to science. There's another section called uh, additional information research support. This is going away as of October, as a biosketch is submitted in October. Um, this will go away. And if you want to share with reviewers any recent research or current research you have ongoing, you must integrate that into the personal statement section. But again, we're in a grace period with the, with the um, biosketch form right now, so you can still use all of those sections. Equipment is a very simple document that lists and describes all the equipment the company already has available for the project. And this is important because typically equipment is not permitted to be purchased in phase one. Now, equipment is, just, is uh, defined as any single item valued at over $5,000 with a life of a year or more. So a laptop is not equipment. Um, an autoclave is equipment. Um, you would not be able to purchase that kind of equipment in a phase one. So in, in the phase one, what we're saying is, you know, hey, Nuco has this list of equipment available in our lab, and it's everything we need to, con to conduct the work we've described in phase one, um, and you just list it out. Sometimes all we put here is um, there's no special equipment required to complete the work outlined, um, and you don't need any additional equipment. That's fine too. Okay, uh, sub-award documentations. Sub-awards refer to uh, when you have a collaboration on your project with a research institution like a, a university, um, that's considered a sub-award. So the, remember the company is the primary applicant, the company gets the award. If you get the award, you will then issue a sub-award to the research institution to conduct research. Each sub-award is required to have the list of information that you see here, each of those bullet points, um, and those documents are required to be routed and approved by that institution. So it's not enough to just say in your research strategy, I'm going to collaborate with Purdue University. You must have this documentation included to, to, to prove that. And this document must be prepared by, routed, and approved by Purdue University. They send it to you, you attach it to your proposal and then you submit the proposal. So each sub-award site prepares their own budget and justification. They will provide you with NIH compliant biosketches for all the key persons on their team. There is a required letter of intent to form a consortium. There is a required, there is a sample template available from, for that from NIH. 
most institutions have their own template for this. It's, it's a standard NIH document and most institutions are familiar with preparing this. Um, you need the facilities and other resources from all the other sites. And then you get their equipment list and you add it to yours, but you don't add it and claim it's your equipment. You add to the document called equipment and you separate it out and you say, Purdue University, and here's the list of their equipment. Typically, they prepare a scope of work that also accompanies the budget. And then if that site, if that you might be partnering with that site for them to conduct your, um, your human subject studies or your vertebrate animal studies. And if they are leading those studies, typically they write those required sections. Oh, also, it's nice to have a letter from the PI um, at the subaward site you know, kind of confirming their participation, but it's not required. All right, these are two annoying documents. Um, and I say they're annoying because most of the time they're not, well, I shouldn't say that, I'd say half the time they're applicable, half, half the, applicable, half the time they're not. But if they're not applicable and they're not attached, reviewers love to point it out and I can't figure out why. Um, so if it's not applicable, and this is authentication of key biological and chemical resources, as well as a document on select agents. If it is not applicable, I attach it with a statement that says this section is not apl applicable to the proposed project. I don't know why they love to point that out, but I just got tired of it. And so I just attached something saying it doesn't apply. But if it does apply, obviously you need to complete the guidelines. With, uh, complete the document according to the guidelines. Um, for resource sharing, NSF, or I'm sorry, SBIR is exempt from this based on the Small Business Innovation Development Act. Um, and you're allowed to, for the resource sharing document, uh, insert this statement right here. And this, they, they tell you this in the guidelines as well, um, that all of the data generated in the project is considered proprietary. Um, under the exemption for the, the Small Business Innovation Development Act. So that's all you need to do for resource sharing. Letters of support is a big one. Um, typically, I've, I've put these letters into these six buckets here. One is um, from consultants and advisors. One is from fee-for-services. These are people who are actually working on the project. And you need to include letters for them to sort of document the fact that you have come to an agreement. Um, they are willing to participate in the project and they understand that they will be participating this many hours for this, this um, hourly rate. And you get a letter from them that says that. Fee for service would be something where more like where you're buying um, 10 widgets for a dollar and you just get a proposal or a quote that says that. Um, all of these letters, by the way, need to be on letterhead, dated, reference the proposal by name, signed with an actual signature, and include full contact information. So it needs to have the person's email address and phone number. Uh, you can also get letters of support from potential customers, uh, which is great, sort of like, hey, look, you know, um, I really want to buy this, we, you know, we're a, we're a, um, trauma supply manufacturer and we really want to buy this product from this company and offer it in our line. We want to license it, you know, and offer it in our line. Um, that's great. Uh, potential investor letters are great. Um, somebody who's sort of watching your technology develop, you've had conversations with them, they're interested in investing, they just need to see a little bit more data. Those are great letters to have. Key opinion leader letters are great to have. Um, sort of saying, hey, you know, typically these letters say something like, hey, I, you know, I'm in this field, I'm a leader in this field, I see all kinds of technologies come and go, but, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in this and it solves an important problem. Bibliography and references cited. Um, you would be expected to have a document with references cited. Um, I would expect there to be a, a minimum of a half a page of references, uh, probably even more. Um, and you can use any reference format that you want, but it just needs to be consistent throughout the document. 
Um, and, and it should really include, it's, it's fine to include some uh, re references that are not peer reviewed journals, but all of your references should not be, you know, MSNBC articles from Yahoo. Um, so it really, the majority really need to be peer reviewed journal articles. Vertebrate animal section is required. If you're gonna use animals, there are very specific guidelines and what goes in that. You know what, I did not cover, did I miss facilities? Oh, we missed this page. Okay, I'm gonna go back for just a second, guys, sorry. Uh, facilities and other resources, this goes right along where equipment is, this goes right with this. So um, this document is required and um, just like equipment, you're gonna talk about your facilities and equipment or your facilities and resources. And then you do a subheader for any other places where work is happening. So typically I'll have NUCO describe the facilities and resources and then University of Arizona describe the facilities and resources. So you, show, you put it all on one page for the reviewer, but you use subheaders to design, to, to distinguish who's is who's. These are the categories that NIH ask for. And if, if this category does not apply to your project, simply say that. So laboratory, not applicable. Clinical, not applicable. Animal, not applicable. Computer, they don't mean your laptop. They mean like giant computer resources that you might need. Typically, um, what we're gonna see most, some, some um, Startups in SBIR do have laboratory descriptions, which is awesome. Uh, most don't have clinical descriptions. Um, some do have computer descriptions. Most have office. You should have office. One of the really important things in SBIR is that um, you, are, you are supposed to be in control of the space where the company operates. Um, and that means that nobody can restrict access for you. So um, typically we say that the company will lease a space and that can be leased within like an incubator, an accelerator, or somewhere like that, as long as you have your own lock and key um, and you can gain access to that, that office space as you want. And you sort of describe that, you know, 500 square foot office with three workstations, all employees are furnished with a laptop and access to high speed internet. Just kind of give the basics. And then what goes under other? I would encourage you to be really creative about what's on other. And this is why this is, I like always talk about this um, photo, this stock photo, because I think it describes exactly what we're trying to tell in other. So if you're in Illinois and you're engaged in the FAST Center or any other of the resources there, you're going to put that under other. Because what you're trying to do is tell reviewers that your company's that itty bitty green plant and you are surrounded by all of these resources who are going to help you grow and nourish you. And that's what we use other for. So if you're involved in any accelerator, if you're involved in any um, sort of like a cohort for, if you've done i if you're participating in any pitch competitions or you're you know, in a, a MBA program for entrepreneurs or whatever, just include all of that information that you can in other to show reviewers that, that your company is being supported. It's more than just a tiny startup with two people. Okay, human subjects. Um, human subjects is like a whole workshop on its own as well. Um, the, what I want you to get away, take away from this is that Human subjects can be involved in your project, even if it's not a clinical trial. Those are two separate things. There are projects that do not involve human subjects, okay? That's in the blue. No human subjects at all. There are projects that involve humans, but it's just specimens or data. That has special paperwork, okay? Then there are studies that involve human subjects and then the next question is, well, how involved are they? Is it a clinical trial? And we're gonna look at the questions for clinical trial on the next page. Almost never is phase one involve a clinical trial, almost never. If human subjects are involved, we gotta look at how they're involved. Do you qualify for an exemption or will it require, um, you know, uh, even an exemption requires IRB, but at any rate, you know, what level are human subjects involved? So if you are in the green, yellow, or orange, 
you are required to complete additional sections relevant to human subjects. So these are the questions for a clinical trial. And I'll tell you that if you're, if you're confused about whether or not your project is a clinical trial, NIH has an awesome website where you can go and kind of do a decision tree and it'll give you the answer. In order to be considered a clinical trial, you must answer yes to all four of these questions. If you answer no to any of them, it is not a clinical trial. Obviously, um, question one, are human subjects involved? Yeah, we're all gonna answer yes to that. Where most people start answering no are questions three and four, for, for phase one. Phase two is a totally different story, but um, most of the time you're not gonna be in a clinical trial for phase one. Here is a list of the human subject documents that are required. And we're not gonna go through all of these today, but what is really important that you take away is even if you have human subjects and you are not a clinical trial, there are still a number of documents that are required. And those include, you still have to provide characteristics of your study, but whoops, you have to do the inclusion of women and minorities. You have to do the inclusion across the lifespan. You have to um, do the protection of human subjects section. You have to do a projected enrollment table. So there are still lots of documents required. Just because you're not a clinical trial, if you have human subjects, you must complete these documents. And I'll tell you, that's a, that's a really, um, pay close attention to that because it's one thing to complete one of those documents wrong. A reviewer can overlook that, but if you guess wrong and don't include any documents about human subjects, you, you're toast. Your toast. They won't, they won't tolerate that at all. They'll know, they'll say like, oh my gosh, these people have no idea what they're doing. Okay, budget. Very quickly. Key points on the budget. You need to propose a budget that's reasonable, appropriate, and consistent with the work proposed. Reasonable for the amount of time and what we know phase one is, which is limited on feasibility, short amount of time, short amount of money, and appropriate for the work proposed. So, you know, if you're, you're proposing um, a study with 55 pigs, that is not appropriate for a phase one. Too much money. You can't do 55 pigs in phase one. Um, so all of those things sort of need to jive together. The budget is not a major factor of review. What reviewers are asked on the budget is, is the budget proposed consistent with the work? That's their main goal. If the answer is yes, they can make comments on the budget like, oh, it's too staff heavy or wow, you know, they, they're paying too much to consultants or whatever, they can make comments about those things, but they're not gonna grade your proposal based on your budget. Only if it's consistent and appropriate for the work proposed. Um, budget is always negotiated at time of award. So you can propose anything you want, but be prepared. They're gonna come back and negotiate if they're gonna fund it. The budget consists of direct costs, which are directly tied to the project work, indirect costs, which are more focused on your operating as a company. Every SBIR is, is allowed to collect a fee or profit of 7%. And then those three things together make your total cost. So that's how we look at the budget. And you can see on the bottom here, those budget categories go from most to least restrictive. Least restrictive is the fee or profit, completely unrestrictive. Use it on whatever you want. So we always get all of the profit. You must prepare a, a budget justification um, that goes in the same order as the budget form and it tells the story of those numbers. So this should sort of remove the shroud of mystery for reviewers on how did you come up with $4,000 for travel? You should have all of your formulas, you should show reviewers everything that includes. Um, th there should be no mystery of where you got your numbers. And the most important thing to remember here is transparency reduces doubt. So the more information you share and the more transparent you are about the budget, the more likely they are to support it. All right, a quick look at review criteria. Review criteria is available for all applications. It so always, follow, always follows the, um, the, the notice of funds. It's at the very end. They always share the review criteria. This is how reviewers score your application. Um, and when you go back and read your application, what I like to do is finish the application, then go read the review criteria, and then read each section and see if you hit those points. 
the review criteria, and you'll recognize some of these subheaders, right? Significance, investigators, so, so what's your team like? Innovation, which we talked about, we're gonna hit them hard with a punch of the innovation is. Approach, that's where you gotta have a lot of detail or they'll score, they'll, they'll love to score you low. Environment, so do you have the equipment and facilities you need? And then budget, human subjects, vertebrate, animals, and more. Those are just sort of extras that they comment on, but, but they're not necessarily a factor of review. Final thoughts, uh, common, common pitfalls, projects that propose um, too much work, too, too aggressive of timelines. Reviewers can see right through that. Uh, common pitfall is too much detail in the background and not enough information in the work plan. It's because people like to talk about what they know, and what they're familiar with, which is stuff you've already done. It's harder to talk about stuff you're gonna do because you're not that familiar with it, but really, really that's where you need to focus. What you will do is always way more important than what you have done. And make sure you include a significant role for your company. Look at the required splits of SBIR and STTR in either program that company must do a fair share of the work. So make sure you provide opportunities for that. And then make sure you include all of your support documentation, which we talked about letters of support, et cetera. Okay. All right, Shelly, what do you think is some of the greatest pitfalls on the on the um, big sections, aims and research strategy? I think you hit on some of them. You definitely want to propose something that's reasonable. Don't propose projects that are totally unreasonable. Remember, this is a feasibility study. This isn't a development study. This is yeah. a feasibility. You're trying to, everything should be geared towards feasibility. Hang on, we do have a question now. Uh, are companies at a disadvantage by being small with only a couple of key personnel versus large company with larger teams? Nope. Nope. The majority of awards go to companies that have between four and nine employees. Um, the majority of proposals that I work on probably have um, between one to five employees. Um, so no, you're not. Everybody in SBIR, that's why they created this program. The program itself is a set aside. So, so it's large businesses cannot compete in this. The definition of a small business is 500 or fewer employees. So this is geared towards small business, which if you're, if you're super familiar with NIH, this is the same reason I would not recommend you as a small business compete for R01. Those grants are primarily given to researchers at large institutions. Compete in the program where you'll be most competitive, which is SBIR. Um, similarly, how competitive would an SBIR application be with a researcher attached, but not a research institute? Uh, it's not bad. Um, if, if you mean the researcher is at the, well, it depends on how you're saying that. If the, if the researcher lives at the research institution, then it's going to have to be a, a sub award, unless that person has a special provision in their contract. Um, they can be a consultant, but if the researcher makes the move to the company, that's not bad. It, it does up your game to be connected with a research institution on some level. Not required, lots of proposals are funded without them, but it does increase your odds. And a further question is um, not necessarily a small team, but maybe a less experienced team versus an experienced team. Yeah, so that's why we go back to looking at your team, having the right people on the bus. So look at, identify those gaps. So for example, you know, let's say you're using, you're creating a, 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 um, a platform that uses machine learning and AI or something for support for um, alcoholics, you know, and, and you are like all about AI. You are the AI machine learning guy, but you don't know anything about recovering from um, alcohol addiction you better get somebody on your team that is an expert in that area. They can be a consultant, they can be an advisor, they could be uh, a researcher at an institution and uh, uh, participate through a sub award. But you have to really look at all the different elements of your project and figure out who's missing. It's fine to have inexperienced people on the team, but they have to be supported by or kind of mentored by, shepherded by more experienced people. Uh, another question I have here, if the customers are already specifically defined in the open solicitation, do we elaborate more on them or do we find other customers? Uh, both. It depends on, um, I mean, most agencies like to see what they would call dual use technology. So 
Um, that's especially true if you're talking about a Department of Defense who typically does define the customers for you. Um, you know, hey, this is great for the warfighter, but a few tweaks and we'll be able to, to put it in the private sector. Um, if they're telling you specific customers, but you're aware of other customers, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with sharing that you're familiar, or you're aware of other markets that, it, that has, has potential. Secondary though, would be secondary in addition to what they're suggesting. Uh, another question is, can you apply basically the same SBIR application to the NIH and NSF at the same time? Well, you can, um, but a couple things. Um, you're talking apples and oranges. So um, you can't take an NIH and just uh, address it to NSF because their requirements and guidelines and formatting it couldn't, be, uh, everything is different. Everything is different. And I've also found it doesn't work well to take it, sit down with an NIH and think, now I'm going to turn it into an NSF. You're better off starting over. But you can submit them and it can be for the same project, but you can only accept one in the odd event they were both funded. And you must disclose when you submit, you, you disclose to each that you've submitted to the other. Um, what do you recommend for company projects that require physical space, but don't yet have the resources or capital to lease it? Well, it depends on what kind of space. Um, if it's lab space or high tech equipment, um, you can look at doing um, core services at a nearby university, which leases the or uh, rents the um, access by the hour. Um, you know, generally speaking, I don't know what you say about this, Shelley, but you know, I, I have always been under the impression from NIH specifically that the company needs to have a lease and some agencies, some institutes or centers, I'll say, within NIH that are more sophisticated, specifically, for example, NCI, will ask to see a lease before they award your funds. And I've heard somebody from NIH say, even if the lease is for a dollar to yourself for your garage, um, you need to have a lease. It's very important that the company has their own space. You can use some of the money from the grant out of indirects to pay for that space. Um, and I would encourage you to look at, you know, an incubator or, um, you know, someplace that leases affordable office space on a monthly basis, you know, four or $500 a month. And you can cover that with your overhead from the grant, but it really is important that the company has their own space. Yeah, I agree. I actually have seen companies get um, marked down saying that the, they don't look like they actually have their own yeah. facilities that will. And that's one of the major, that was one of the major points. They actually liked the research, but that was one of the major things. So I think it's important. Yeah, I do too. It's like a commit, it shows a commitment. You know what I mean? Like you've really got skin in the game kind of thing. There's a question about what percentage of um, the funds should go to the institute or collaborators. So you probably need to specify for SBIR versus an STTR. Yeah, there's very specific requirements depending on if you're doing SBIR versus STTR. Um, those, those splits are readily available um, on the internet. SBIR, the company must do a, um, must do 66% of the work. So it's only allowed a third out the door. Um, STTR, the company must do a minimum of 40% of the work. Um, so it sort of depends on which one you're doing and, and how you want to split that up. Can customer support letters come from potential international companies? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think, and I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on this, Shelly, but everything is always US first. And so like a, an international client or customer would be great after you've commercialized in the US, um, but I don't think it should be your primary source. I would say I wouldn't want it to be your primary source, but if you don't have any others, I would also have the uh, international company point out if they're doing business in the US. That's, that's good, yeah. And that might be helpful. I mean, if you don't have anything else, like something, some support is always better, but definitely. True try to focus it on the U.S. as much as you can. Yeah, I think that's good feedback. Um, with remote working being the norm last year and possible future, is it okay for team members to work remotely? Hmm. It is, but it's really important. Something I see from reviewers all the time, they're very concerned about team communication. 
Um, and so I would, uh, you know, if you do that, I would, I would probably not say we ro work remotely. I would probably instead say, you know, you work out of this incubator space and you meet, you know, every other week for team meetings. And when you're not together in person, you know, you utilize, make use of, of tools such as Zoom to stay in regular contact or something. I don't think I would, I don't think I would focus solely on that. Even in the pandemic, reviews came back um, concerned about team communication and um, not happy with that. At least it hasn't happened yet. Maybe they'll change their mind, but not yet. And the last one I have is, is it absolutely important to license the invention or discovery to qualify for SBIR grant eligibility? You must be in control of the technology that you are working on at time of award. So that's another thing that they will ask to see proof of. If it's a license, you must show um, that you have the rights by time of award. Um, so you, 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 you need to be in control of it. I've seen, um, you know, sometimes people even will take like off patent drugs um, and repurpose, you know, and even though they're off patent, reviewers will be like, oh, I, you know, I don't know, this is scary IP stuff. So I think they're, they're really keen on um, the cleaner, the better, I would say. And so the more you could say up front that you have access to it, you hold the license, or that's why I think it's great to be clear about your IP position right up front. Um, you know, just the cleaner, the better. Thank awesome. you very much, Chris. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.